Okay, just waiting for the recording to come. Okay, the recording has started. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the class today on uh, Romans. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to finish the um, last two chapters today on Romans, and uh, we should be uh, done today but, uh, if everything goes well. Let's pray and uh, get started. Can I request somebody to please pray? Maybe um, um, Aaron, could you please pray if your connection is okay? And then we will start. Yes, Pastor. Oh, let me pray. Uh, we just thank you, so thank you for uh, helping us in every meeting, in every day, whatever to share the day. To have you have help us all to receive the word, Father, and have you help us to obey. Okay, man. Thank you, Aaron. Um, couldn't hear very clearly, but uh, anyway, thank you. And uh, let's go to Romans. Uh, welcome everyone to the class. So last week, uh, we covered till Romans chapter 14. We have, uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, in uh, Romans uh, 12, 13, 14, the Apostle Paul has been speaking about how we live our Christian life. Um, a Christian living, especially. So, um, as we had seen in uh, chapters 9, 10, 11, uh, he had uh, taken time to explain to the believers how God was working with both the Jews uh, and Gentiles. Okay, no problem, Aaron. I can uh, see your message. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, so in Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, the Apostle Paul had explained, you know, how God was still at work with the Jews and the church. Now, wh what is God doing? And so it's a beautiful, beautiful explanation to us uh, to understand what God is doing in, in these times that um, although the door has been opened to the Gentiles, God hasn't forgotten his plan and his promise to the Jewish people. So having explained that from chapter 12, Paul comes back to speaking to the believers and now he's addressing how believers have to live the Christian life. Uh, so chapter 12, he talks about uh, uh, several different things, you know, starting off with, you know, being renewed in our mind, um, talking about how we use our gifts to serve people, and then just how to relate to other believers, you know, being hospitable, being uh, forgiving, and so on. He, chapter 12. Chapter 13, he goes into, which we saw last week, 13 and 14, where he goes into talking about how should believers re relate to civil authorities, government authorities. Now, we saw that last week, and especially uh, it is very significant when he's speaking in the context in which he's speaking, because there is the uh, Roman government, uh, the Roman Empire, more I should say, rather than just government. But you know, it's an empire. It's an em there's an emperor. There are kings. There are soldiers. Uh, there are civil authorities, and uh, he still instructs people, believers, to walk in submission to do the right thing and uh, you know to to honor the authorities that have been set and then after that he changes a little bit to talk about um, as we get into Romans 14 uh, to talk about you know being sensitive I'm um, using the word sensitive meaning you know being mindful of uh, other believers even as we relate to them, especially those who might be weak in faith, meaning they're new, they're new. And so they don't have the same kind of spiritual understanding that we may have. 
And so for us, it is important to be mindful of them that the, the, the basic thing he says is, look, don't do anything by which an other brother is going to be caused to stumble in their faith in Christ. That's the bottom line, so to speak. That's the, some, that's what you keep in mind. So be mindful of you know things, and especially when it comes to things that don't really matter, like food and uh, what days you observe. You know, he says, look, these things don't really matter because the kingdom of God is more than what you eat and drink. It is a righteousness and peace and joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. That's that's what the kingdom of God is really about. So, you know, we can give up or, you know, we can uh, uh, adjust or accommodate these differences when it comes to non-essential things like uh, food and observing days uh, because each one will have their own preferences it's okay we just be respectful of uh, uh, the other's preference or other's choice and don't let that become something that would cause you to hurt another brother another person in the faith right so that's the essence of romans 14. so now we are going to look into romans uh, 15 and then uh, uh, Romans chapter 16 is more of the uh, the conclusion, like the goodbyes or, you know, the thank yous, uh, the closing of any letter that would be written typically, right? So Romans 15, uh, Paul, uh, the, the first part of that verse, chapter, he's, he's teaching us on how he, how we, you know, we can learn from the Old Testament and how we could, you know, be mindful, continue. The, the same thought is there uh, to bear with those who are, are weak. So that same thought is in the first part of Romans 15. And then from the somewhere in the middle of Romans 15, he kind of moves in towards sharing some about his work and about his ministry and about his plans. Um, and then he kind of starts wrapping up the letter by, you know, just uh, uh, affirming uh, and recognizing many of his uh, co-workers. So let's please um, uh, read Romans chapter 15. Uh, we're going to uh, read the first uh, 13 verses. Romans chapter 15, uh, verses 1 to 13. So Paul is kind of getting ready to close off his epistle, his letter. And these are more of his, uh, he's kind of closing closing thoughts. So Romans 15 verses 1 to 13. Could somebody read that for us, please? Dave, would you be able to read it for us? If your connection is okay. Or... Uh, Maybe anybody else, so Thomas or Siddharth, if your connection is fine. Romans 15, 1 to 13, please. I'll read past. Romans you. 15, verse 1 to 13. Know those who are mature in their faith can easily be recognized, for they don't leave it to please themselves, but have learned to passionately embrace others in their immaturity. Our goal must be to empower others to do what is right, and good for them, and to bring them into spiritual maturity. For not even the most powerful one of all, the anointed one, lived to please himself. His life fulfilled the scripture that says, all the insults of those who insulted you fall upon me. What God has written beforehand is meant to instruct us in how to live. The scripture imparts to us encouragement and action so that we can live in hope and endure in all things. Now may God, the source of great endurance and comfort, grace you with unity among yourself, which flows from your relationship with Jesus, the Anointed One. Then, then with the unanimous rush of passion, you will with one voice glorify God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. You will bring God glory when you accept and welcome one another in partners, just as the Anointed One has fully accepted you and received you as His partner, the God of hope for Jews and non-Jews. I'm convinced that Jesus, the Messiah, 
was sent as a servant to the Jewish people to fulfill promise God made to our ancestor and to prove God's faithfulness. And now, because of Jesus, the non-Jewish people of the world can glorify God for his kindness to them, fulfilling the prophecy of scripture. Because of, his, because of this, I will proclaim you among the nations, and they may even hear me sing praises to your name. And in another place it says, you who are not Jews, celebrate life right alongside his Jewish people. And again, praise the Lord, all you who are not Jews, and let the people of the earth raise their voice in the praises to him. And Isaiah prophesied, and here to David throne will emerge, and he will raise up as a ruler over all non-Jewish nations, for all their hopes will be met in him. Now may God, the fountain of hope, fill you to overflowing with a containable joy and perfect peace, as you trust in him, and the power of the Holy Spirit, continually surround your life with a super abundance until you're radiant with the hope. Amen. Thank you, Thomas. Thomas, which version uh, is that? Is that the Amplified or? Uh, sorry, that's a TPT translation. I forgot to change. Uh, no, no, which translation is this? That's a TPT. Passion translation. Oh, this is the, pa you, you read from the Passion translation. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's look at what Paul is teaching us, what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us uh, through the writing of the Apostle Paul. So the first part, um, chapter 15, uh, verses uh, 1 to, you know, all the way up to verse 7, uh, he's still dealing with um, being, like we said, you know, chapter 14, he was saying being mindful, being uh, sensitive, being respectful towards other believers. So He's continuing with that same thought in chapter 15, the first few verses. He says, you know, those who are strong, because you're strong in your faith, you know, you bear with the weaknesses of the weak. That means, you know, uh, uh, those who are perhaps still new in their faith, or maybe they may have been in the faith, but they're not really strong in their faith. Like they may still be growing, still uh, in, in a young younger stage in their faith, he says, you know, you bear with them. So what does it mean by saying you bear with them? He says, you know, don't do things just to please yourself, but do what is good to the building up of the weak. So how do I know that I am bearing with the weaknesses of the weak? That means I'm not you know, okay, I may be a believer strong in my faith. I've been in the Lord for some time. Uh, I'm not doing something just to make myself feel happy or good. But I, whatever I do, I try to build up the person who is weak. So he says, you know, don't please your own self, but try to please your neighbor, please the other person. Do what is good for the other person. In what sense? To build them up. That's verse 2, Romans 15, verse 2. Right? So he's continuing with that same truth that he had, that, that was, that we read in chapter 14. I remember, of course, when Paul wrote it, it wasn't written uh, in chapter and verse. So this, this thought is actually continuing. And uh, and so this is something we, we need to keep in mind, uh, even in, uh, in, in our, you know, when we relate to others. Um, there may be a younger brother, a person a little newer in the faith. Uh, and now we, for those of us who've been in the faith, we may know certain things and you know how to do it. But uh, maybe we know how to pray. How we know, you know, what language to use in prayer. And somebody who is new to the faith may not necessarily pray uh, the way we we would or use the kind of scriptures we would when we pray, because we know the scriptures. Uh, maybe they don't know. So what do we do? We don't go and, you know, uh, make them feel bad that they don't know the scriptures or don't know how to pray. No, what do we do? We bear with their weakness. I mean, that still uh, where they are. And we do what we can do to build them up for their edification, you know, gently, lovingly show them 
See, this is what the word says. This is what God has promised. This is how we should be praying. Uh, this is how we should be believing God and so on. So you, you know, you do it for their edification. And then he verse three, he points us to even to Christ. He says, you know, look at Jesus. I mean, he took on the reproaches of those who reproached him. I mean, the very people that he was dying for who, whom he came to say were the ones who caused him to feel ashamed who you know belittled him and he took it right so it doesn't matter if we temporarily take you know certain things because of the benefit that would bring for other people and then he says you know uh versus uh, verse four he says whatever things are written in the past, that means in the in the Old Testament, were written for our learning. So we could learn from the scriptures. We could learn from what has been written. And he's going to really point to that in a few verses on, you know, saying just so he has something in mind. He's saying, you know, what whatever has been written in the past, we can learn from it. And we receive patience and comfort through the scriptures. So there is the ability to be patient or have endurance or perseverance and comfort, uh, strength, consolation, encouragement that is brought into our lives through the scriptures as we look at what other people have journeyed through, right? So that's why it's good for us, you know, when you look into the scriptures, you know, you look at people in the Old Testament, uh, people in who've journeyed with God and see how, you know, they, they walked with God. We, through, the, through their lives, we receive perseverance, the ability to persevere, endurance, and we receive comfort, strength, so that we too can have hope or the ability to look forward with expectation through what we go, what we are going through. So that's, that's beautiful, right? We, we receive patience and comfort through the scriptures, through the word of God, so that we could be people full of hope. And then uh, he says, you know, he, he uh, ultimately he wants them, he wants the believers to be like-minded. This is verse five and five through seven. He wants them to be like-minded, to be of one mind and one mouth. You know, so uh, this is so important. Uh, one mouth, one mind, one voice. That uh, uh, as believers, we 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 try our best to uh, be like this, to be like-minded, one one mind, one voice, so that we can glorify God. Now, you know, in today's world, Christian world, something like this may be so difficult uh, for for the for the people of God to be of to be like-minded to be of one mind and one voice but when we look at the scriptures when we draw when we learn from the scriptures and receive patience and comfort through the scriptures we it's part of our it's something we do or we must do to maintain that unity in the spirit. Like what he has already taught us in chapter 14. Don't let the non-essential things divide us. Don't, you know, uh, don't judge another brother just because, you know, he looks at days and food differently from you. Okay, that's, you know, each one, like he said in chapter 14, you know, each one is answerable to the Lord. So he may choose his food and he may choose which day to, you know, of observe as an important day. That's his choice. And if we can't refrain from judging each other on these matters and instead choose to build each, each other up, then we can work towards being like-minded. Then we are working towards being like-minded, being of one mind and one voice so that we can glorify God together. But, you know, sadly, some of these non-essential things are the things that become so big in the church these days. You know, um, people argue and fight and get divided about 
non-essential things. You know, each one, you, you make your own choice and don't fight. Yeah. Uh, just, just be peaceful. Like he said, you know, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Okay. You know, you want to do this, fine. You don't want to do it, don't, don't do it. But let's not fight about it. Instead, let us please one another or bless one another. Let us edify one another so that we can be like-minded, one, one mind, one, one voice, and glorify, verse 6, glorify God and Father for Lord Jesus Christ. It says, verse 7, therefore, receive one another, just as so Christ also received us to the glory of God. You know, verse 7, it's a very simple verse. But I think it's, it's so uh, deep, it's so powerful. He says, receive one another as Christ received us. Now he's talking about believers. You know, there may be a strong believer, a weak believer, uh, believers who have different, uh, you know, uh, uh, things. Uh, but what do you do? We receive one another. We are welcoming to one another. And so it's a challenge for you and me. So even when we meet believers who are different from us, in the sense they may think differently, they may have different uh, positions, rather than letting those differences divide us, Paul is telling us, receive, be welcoming, be, and if you want to use the word, be embracing, be kind, be welcoming to one another, receive one another. And he points to the ultimate. He says, just as Christ received us. And if, and if, we, if Christ could despise anybody, he would despise us because, you know, we are nowhere like him. But he still received us. Right? So uh, that's how um, Paul uh, the Holy Spirit through Paul is telling us we must live. And I want to encourage each of us, you know, to try to do that, even as we meet believers who may be different to, you know, our persuasions or, you know, they may be different denominations. Um, they may not always believe everything we believe and so on, but it's okay. We can receive one another as long as we are here to follow Jesus and glorify Jesus we can still receive and agree on the important things. Then verses 8 through uh, 13, uh, Paul points back to the Old Testament. He says, hey, even though God was working through the Jewish people, through them, there were so much that was spoken of that the Gentiles would be blessed. And he, and he quotes, you know, three different, three or four different scriptures here. Uh, verse 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, he's quoting from Psalm and from Isaiah and Deuteronomy. Uh, he's just quoting different scriptures saying, look, all these scriptures in the Old Testament are saying that the Gentiles will praise God. The Gentiles will give glory to God. So even there, we learn that while God was working with the Jews and giving them the promises, it is all being done so that the Gentiles would glorify God. And that's what God has been working towards. So he's reminding them once again that God is God, both of the Jews and the Gentiles. His promises to the Jewish people was ultimately to bless the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world. And so... God is God, both of the Jews and the Gentiles. And then it's almost like a benediction, verse 13, uh, may the God of hope, the God of hope. And it's very interesting to see how he refers to God. In verse 5, he says, the God of patience and comfort. In verse 13, the God of hope, the God of patience, the God of comfort, the God of hope. God of patience fills us with endurance. The God of comfort fills us with comfort or consolation or strength. God of hope fills us with hope. So God of patience, God of comfort, God of hope. 
and he imparts that to us. So he says in verse 13, may God, may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace and cause you to abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, almost like a benediction saying, I, I pray this or I bless you with this uh, joy, peace and hope that comes from the Holy Spirit as you believe in him. Right. So Paul now is up to this point has been his teaching or instruction to the believers. Then from verse 14 is just speaking his heart about his ministry, uh, about some of his plans for the ministry uh, from verse 14. So let's uh, read, uh, break this up into two sections and we will read verses 14 through 21 and uh, then we will read the remaining uh, passage. So Romans chapter 15 verses 14 to 21. Could somebody read that for us please? Romans 15, 14 to 21. Okay, maybe Thomas, uh, maybe you have to read. I'm not sure if the, um, the others, um, their connection is okay or their mics are okay. Yes, sir. I continue to read fast. Okay, Kiran. No, 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 it's okay, you can. Okay, I will read. 14 to 21. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points as remain, reminding you because of the grace given to me by God that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ to all Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that, that the offering of the Gentiles might be acceptable, sancti sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I have reason to glory in Christ Jesus in the, in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient and mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about all like, rings, I have, fully, mm -hmm. rings, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ, and so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I, I should build one another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. Mm. Thank you. So, Paul uh, now is shifting towards, you know, uh, some personal thoughts, and then he would bring this letter to a close. So he says, okay, brothers, verse 14, you know, uh, I am confident uh, that uh, you are full of goodness, uh, you are full, uh, filled with knowledge, and you are able to admonish one another. Right? So he says, he says, brothers, you know, I'm confident that, yeah, you will, you know, you're able to do these things, that you are people who are good people, you are people who are filled with knowledge. You have understanding of these things. And you will truly be there to be an encouragement to each other. Right. So after he's giving all his instructions and saying, look, this is how we're supposed to relate to each other. And this is how, you know, we are supposed to 
uh, uh, you know, be relating to the Jews and the non-Jewish people and all of that. He's saying, okay, brothers, I am confident that you will be able to do this. I'm confident that you, all of you are good people. Uh, you, you have this understanding, you have this knowledge, and that you will be there to really encourage and uh, motivate and inspire each other to do these things. That's verse 14. Then he says, you know, verse 15, um, but I've uh, been bold in what I've written to you because of the grace of God given to me. That means, you know, uh, uh, some of the things that he stated, obviously, uh, will, would have challenged um, some of their thinking. Uh, in, in terms, especially in terms of how they were to relate to each other, Jewish and non-Jewish believers, uh, how they were to, you know, uh, be kind to each other and serve each other and so on. So he knows that some of them, some of those things that he has written is strong and uh, challenging for them. So he says, look, I've been bold to write these things to you because I know the grace of God given to me. And that's something interesting that when you are aware and when you know the grace that God has placed on your life, you can move boldly in your grace, right? Now, what do I mean by that? That means that you can operate boldly in the grace that's on your life. And you don't, now when I say operate boldly, I'm not saying being arrogant, being proud, or thinking you're better than other people. No, uh, that means, what we're talking about is that knowing the grace of God on your life, you can step out and you can boldly serve people. You can boldly move in that grace, whether it's the ministry of the word or praying for people or when you know the grace of God that's on your life. And that's what Paul is telling us there in verse 15. He says, you know, I've written boldly, but, you know, I know the grace that God has given to me. I mean, this is, an, this is a way God works in my life. Uh, God can use the things that I speak and teach and a minister, and so I, I'm moving in that grace, Paul. And that's that's a powerful thing for you and me to take uh, away. Move boldly in the grace of God that's on your life. You know that God has graced you, gifted you, and so you can just step in and move in that. And Paul begins to say, he highlights this the grace that he's referring to. That's in verses 16 onwards. He says, you know, uh, I know the grace God's given to me. What is what is the grace of God in my life? He's made me a minister to the Gentiles. I can minister the gospel of God and uh, that, um, you know, the Gentiles will be brought in by the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, therefore, you know, I can speak boldly about this. I'm not ashamed um, to speak of the things God has indeed worked through me. And that he begins to talk about how, you know, that um, God has uh, brought the Gentiles to faith in Christ through the word and deed, through mighty signs, wonders, and miracles, so that uh, he has uh, fully preached the gospel from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum. Uh, Illyricum is, uh, is uh, uh, or war, it was a place in the northern part of Albania. Uh, modern day Albania, which is in Eastern Europe. So what Paul is saying is, you know, from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have proclaimed Jesus Christ to the Gentiles with the power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I know that's the grace that God has given me. And also his grace on my life is such that I can go to places where the gospel has not been preached and I can um, establish a work there uh, so that I don't have to build on somebody else's foundation. So Paul is describing the grace that's on his life, right? And so he says, you know, uh, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing boldly because of the grace of God in my life. And how does he know that? Because he's proved that. So again, here's a second important lesson for us. As you prove the grace of God on your life, as you move in the grace of God, that means you are exercising it, you're doing it, you're practicing it, you're living it, that's, that's your life and ministry. You're proving the grace of God on your life. And when you prove the grace of God in your life, you can move boldly in that grace. Right? So in Paul's case, the grace on his life was to minister the gospel uh, to the Gentiles, from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, boldly, unashamedly, with signs, wonders, and miracles, uh, bringing the Gentiles obedient to Jesus Christ, and to establish work where there was no work. 
you know, so he says, I'm not, I'm not going and building on anybody else's foundation. I'm going and doing something new, brand new, a pioneer, um, uh, a ground breaker, so to speak. I said, that's the grace of my life. I know it. I can talk about it. And I'm not talking about it boastfully, Paul says, but I am speaking of the things which Christ has accomplished through me. Right? So two key, two key takeaways from that passage here. Know the grace of God on your life by proving it over and over again. And when you know the grace of God, secondly, when you know the grace of God on your life, you can move in it boldly. So you prove the grace of God on your life by operating in it. And then you can move in the grace of God boldly. You can step out, begin to flow in it, right? So for each of us, we must know what is the grace God has placed on our lives? And then serve God boldly. Now, I'm not talking about being arrogant and self-dependent and uh, making yourself as some big person. No, that's not what Paul is saying here. He's saying, this is, what, this is the way Christ has been working through me. And so I know it and I can speak about it with confidence. Okay. So having said that, Let's look at the last section of chapter 15. Let's please read verses 22 to 32. He's sharing here about some of his travel plans and his um, you know, desires for the people. So verse 22 to 32, somebody could read that. Maybe Thomas, you can read so it I now. Would. Okay, Prince, thank you. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you, but now, no longer having a place in this world and having a great desire that uh, this many years to come to you. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you for I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy, uh, enjoy your company for a while but now i am going to jerusalem to minister to the saints for it placed those who macedonia and akaya to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints and they are their devotors for if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister to them in material things. Material things. Therefore, when I have performed this and have sailed to them, this port I shall go by way of you to Spain. But I know that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in prayer, in prayers to God for me, that I may be believed, I may be delivered from those who Judea who do not believe, and that may service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, to the saints, that I may come to you with joy by the will of God and may, may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. 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 So this last passage in chapter 15, last section, Paul is sharing some of his travel plans. And so remember at this time when Paul is writing, he's writing from Corinth. And uh, it's towards you know the end of his third missionary journey. And uh, he's, he's planning, okay, from here, I'm going to go to Jerusalem because he has collected offering. 
uh, from the churches in Corinth. That's Achaia, refers to the district in which Corinth was, and uh, and Macedonia. So that's a district in which we had uh, uh, several other churches across uh, the agency uh, uh, where Paul administered, like Philippi and Thessalonica and other places. So he had collected uh, offerings from these churches to take back to the church in Jerusalem to help uh, the believers there because at that time the church in Jerusalem was, was going through a difficult time, a famine and so on. So uh, so he's sharing his plans, right? So I'm planning to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to give the offering that I have received. I'm going to give it to the to the believers in Jerusalem. And then I'm planning to go to Spain. So Spain is like the father's part uh, that um, uh, uh, on, on Eastern Europe that Paul would have uh, uh, advanced to. So, uh, you know, he, his plan was that. But you can see also here that for many years he had desired to go to Rome. So he's sharing his plans. He's saying, you know, I desire to come to you. Uh, and my plan is to go to Spain and uh, I will come to Rome. And from Rome, I will go to Spain, uh, of course, to preach the gospel. Uh, to proclaim Christ. And then he gives this assurance. I mean, or he, you know, he's very confident. He tells them, look, when I come to you, in, to you in Rome, I know I will come to you in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. And that's in verse 29. The fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now, from it is from that in verse 29 that we get the term full gospel. You know, and uh, so there are churches or, you know, type of churches that call them full gospel churches that means what do we mean by that that means we these churches would proclaim the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of christ uh, the gospel the good news of jesus bringing for not only forgiveness of sins but healing for the bodies deliverance uh, uh, from every demonic power and so on so the full blessing of the gospel of christ they would preach so that's what they call it they're called full gospel churches. Right? And, but it's taken here from this verse 29, the fullness of the blessing. We're bringing you the full blessing of the gospel. It's um, uh, the, good, the good news of Jesus that affects the total person, spirit, soul, and body in every area of your life. So Paul is telling them, I will, I, I'm, having, I'm, I'm confident that I will come to you with a full blessing of the gospel of Christ. But I just want to highlight a few things here. And it's very interesting. Paul says in the next verse, verse 13, I want you to strive together with me in prayer. So think of, look at that phrase, you know, strive with me in prayer. That means you engage with me and you are working together with me in prayer. So that's very interesting. These believers are in Rome. He is in Corinth and he's planning to make his trip to Jerusalem. And he's saying, uh, sorry, he's in Ephesus, I think, at that time. Yeah, Acts 19. Um, and he's saying, I want you to strive with me in prayer. Strive with me. So, that means we come alongside other people and we lend them our spiritual strength as we pray with them. So it's very powerful. So when we pray with people, I mean, we could be in different places, but when we pray for them and pray, in, when you're joining them in prayer, coming into agreement with them in prayer. We are striving together with them for the purpose that they are pursuing, their God-appointed purpose. So in Paul's case, he says, you know, I want you to strive together with me in prayer, especially in verse 31, because he says he knows that in Judea, Judea is, you know, the, the region around Jerusalem, uh, there are Jews who are very angry with Paul. They don't like Paul. 
and they're just waiting for an opportunity to get rid of him. So he knows that. That's what he says in verse 31, uh, that I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. That means these are Jewish people who are totally against Paul because Paul was a Jew. I mean, Paul, a Jew, has now become a Christian. He's a preacher of the gospel. So Paul is aware of that, and he, he invites these believers in Rome to strive with him in prayer. Now Paul goes to Jerusalem. Uh, he brings the gift there. Uh, but in Jerusalem, what happens is that he is captured by the Jews. And uh, then Paul raises his defense. He is kept for two years in Caesarea, uh, which is um, um, uh, on the seaport. It's a seaport uh, 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 to the east of Jerusalem along the coast. So he's sent over there. He's kept there for two years. He appeals to Caesar. And then uh, he's sent from Caesarea to Rome now along with this big uh, escort or battalion of soldiers who are bringing him to Rome. So uh, situations change, uh, but Paul comes to Rome and you can imagine, uh, and, and the fact is even before he reaches Rome, the, the believers from Rome are there to you know receive him and, and um, Paul has come to Rome or he's brought to Rome in order to make his appeal uh, to Caesar. And, and so he's kept in house arrest at Rome for about two years, uh, during which time he you know, freely shares the gospel. He teaches about the things of the kingdom of God uh, to the believers, to the people at Rome. So uh, in a very different way, uh, Paul's desire to be in Rome is fulfilled but uh, you know and, and he just ministers to the disciples or the believers there at Rome and in verse 32 he tells them look uh, you know while he's writing this letter he says you know I want to be refreshed together with you and sure enough and he's there uh, uh, during that time I'm sure the believers there would have definitely refreshed him and they would have been strengthened uh, as he ministered to them although the circumstances were very different from what you know, he would have imagined at that time, but he gets to minister to them for at least two years uh, when he's brought there. Okay, so let's pause here. We'll take a break, a 10 minute break, and we will read through chapter 16, uh, which is more of a closing chapter. Uh, but we'll just, you know, pick up a few thoughts here from chapter 16, and then we will finish. Right. So let's take a 10 minute break and we will uh, come back after 10 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 